first installment of our three book series, Three Books, Creative Habits. I am Corey, one of the hosts of the Art History Babes podcast. If you're unfamiliar with us, make sure to check out the podcast that will be linked down below for you. Today, I am going to discuss three books concerning creativity, creative habits, creative output, Daily Rituals by Mason Curry, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, and Elizabeth Gilbert's Big Magic. Okay, the first book on the list, Daily Rituals by Mason Curry. This is a really fun book. It is also incredibly well researched. Like, I can't even imagine how long it took him to write this. This book takes you through various visual artists, writers, composers, psychologists, philosophers, thinkers, famous creative people throughout time, and breaks down what their daily habits were like, what their average day was, how they approached the creative process. If this book proves one thing, it proves that there is no one right way to approach creativity and that you really do have to find what works for you. I think this book is a good book to kind of read about like a few artists at a time, at least that's how I did it, kind of like a daily thing. Pick it up, read a few pages, it doesn't, you know, have like a continuous narrative or anything. A good right before bed read. Actually, great read for the beginning of the day. Start your day, have your coffee, read a couple daily rituals, get inspired. This actually isn't coffee, this is tea, but start your day off right, read about the way that a lot of really important artists throughout time have started their days and how they set themselves up for optimal creative output. This, this is a good, good morning inspiration type book for sure. I'll kind of go through and give you a few of my favorites and also try to give you a bit of an idea as to the vast differences. Why am I still holding this? To kind of start off on one end of the spectrum, Francis Bacon. Apparently Francis Bacon was maybe not surprisingly one of those artists that thrived off of the disorder around him. According to this, Francis Bacon enjoyed working with hangovers, which I do not understand at all because I am the worst hungover person in the world. I am completely useless. Quote from Francis Bacon, My mind is crackling energy and I can think very clearly. I'm very familiar with that crackle that he's discussing and I cannot think clearly when that is going on. But apparently it worked to his benefit and it helped him in his creative process. Toulouse-Lautrec, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. Um, if you know anything about, about Toulouse, he was kind of a party animal. He apparently did his best creative work at night. He often would spend all night drinking and drawing and painting at various brothels and cabarets. Toulouse Trek inspired one of the characters in Moulin Rouge. She's, you know, a central figure in that Moulin Rouge-esque time period. So that's what he was doing every night. <laughs> he was going to cabarets, he was going to brothels, and he was making art, and he was drinking a lot. But the thing is, he wouldn't really go to sleep after that, or if he did, it would be for a very short amount of time. And then he'd be back up again early to print lithographs, and then off to lunch, where apparently he would just keep drinking. Uh, sometimes he'd catch a little nap in the middle of the day, but he was not a big sleeper. Sounds to me like he was kind of one of those sleep when I'm dead kind of people. He knew that this was unsustainable. He's been quoted as saying that he was expecting himself to burn out. And sadly, but perhaps not surprisingly, he died at the age of 30, 36 from complications due to syphilis and alcoholism. So he did burn out quite soon. So that's one end of the spectrum, the Francis Bacon, Toulouse-Lautrec, drinking a lot, lots of disorder, lots of chaos, and it works for some people. On the other end of the spectrum, we have William James, the psychologist and philosopher. He believed vehemently in the power of ritual. He really believed in having daily rituals and sticking to them. He also believed in mixing them up, but still having rituals that you stuck to. I have this really good quote from him. The more of the details of our daily life we can hand over to the effortless custody of automatism, the more our higher powers of mind will be set free for their own proper work. There is no more miserable human being than one in whom nothing is habitual but indecision. 
and for whom the lighting of every cigar, the drinking of every cup, the time of rising and going to bed every day, and the beginning of every bit of work are subjects of express volitional deliberation. I dig it. I'm about it. And not to say that I live that that organized of a life by any means, but I think he's on to something here that we need to create daily habits in order to set our minds free. And they won't be they won't be caught up in the chaos. Which makes a lot of sense. Another person I was really excited to find out who's also on this end of the spectrum, David Lynch, which makes me very happy because I think David Lynch is brilliant. And also, it's kind of unexpected. At least I thought it was kind of unexpected that he is much more of like an orderly thinker. He meditates twice daily, 20 minutes each, and he's been doing this every single day for over 33 years. So kudos to you, David Lynch. I, uh look up to you and your meditation habits. He is someone who who follows a very strict schedule. There's a story of him just going to the same cafe every day. And, and he says that that's where some of his most creative ideas come from. Like b being in the same place every day kind of allows those creative ideas to come up from the depths uh, because you've created a bit of order for yourself. Maya Angelou's kind of an interesting one. She couldn't write at home. And apparently she likes to keep her house like very neat and very beautiful and like a really positive environment. But because it was so positive, she couldn't write there. And she would go to hotels and motels and do all of her writing in hotel rooms. Very interesting. Oh, and my favorite, I think I'll leave you off with this one. Georgia, Georgia O'Keeffe. Georgia O'Keeffe, this is just my style. I feel like she's kind of in the middle a little bit, but she definitely loves her kind of her daily routine. And she has a very kind of like relaxed day, which is definitely my vibe. I like to get up when the dawn comes, O'Keeffe told an interviewer in 1966. The dogs start talking to me and I like to make a fire and maybe some tea and then sit in bed and watch the sun come up. Delightful. The morning is the best time. There are no people around. My pleasant disposition likes the world with nobody in it. I like that. Feel you, Georgia. Georgia O'Keeffe lived in the New Mexico desert when she created a lot of her work. And so she obviously liked solitude a lot and she loved the beauty of the desert. You can see that in a lot of her work. She got a lot of work done. You know, her painting was so important to her and, and she always made time for it, but she... She didn't put herself on a super rigid schedule, but there was kind of this habitual, you know, she'd wake up early in the morning, she'd have her breakfast, she'd, she'd enjoy her morning in a way that seems very meditative to me. She wouldn't hurry. I love that. I hate hurrying. <laughs> uh, she wouldn't hurry through her day. She would just take time with the day and she didn't feel the need to hurry to get her work done because she just felt like there'd be time for it because she always made time for it. So Georgia, Georgia's my style. But I recommend that you pick this book up and maybe, you know, like I said, find some inspiration. I think there's things to be learned from every different style. It's also just really fascinating for anyone, you know, all, all of my historians out there, all of you that enjoy learning about the lives of artists. If you're into biography, this is just nuggets of biography, basically. So definitely check this book out. The next book I will be discussing is The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Break through the blocks and win your inner creative battles. Um, so my experience with this book is kind of interesting. The first time I read it, I was 19 years old. And I just reread it for this video. And it really proved to me how much you change as a person in a decade. <laughs> so the first time I read it when I was 19, I, you know, I just started undergrad. I was like a freshman, sophomore in undergrad. And I thought it was like the most brilliant thing ever. I did reread it for this video. And I do have some criticisms of it. I think it's very black and white. And I don't think creativity is a very black and white thing. So let's discuss. It is a great book for just kicking you in the ass. Like it really kind of breaks down like you need to just sit down and do the work, which I, I think is good sometimes. I am a believer in the occasional dose of tough love and he provides it here. And it's not just tough love. Like he, he provides it in a way that is interestingly both spiritual 
But if you're not a very spiritual person, he also kind of provides more logical type metaphors if that's not really your thing. It's definitely meant to be positive, trying to, to just make a more creative society. The entire intention of this book is, is a very good thing. He introduces some really powerful ideas to thinking about uh, creative blocks, creative battles, those kind of things. The biggest idea, the biggest takeaway from this book is the concept of resistance. He talks a lot about resistance as being this force, essentially, that keeps you from making stuff. Like, it keeps you from whatever your dreams are, be they entrepreneurial or artistic or whatever it is that you want to do or have any inkling to do, resistance is what keeps you from doing it. His breakdown of that is, I think, very valuable and why you should read this book. Also, this book is crazy easy to read. Not only is it, like, super short, but a lot of the pages are just, like, like paragraphs. So you can get through this book in a couple of hours. One of his moments really early on in the book, he's got kind of a tough love moment that I love. I'm gonna find it and I'm gonna read it to you. Casting yourself as a victim is the antithesis of doing your work. Don't do it. If you're doing it, stop. I love that. I think that that is very straightforward and very necessary for all of us sometimes because it's just so easy and so common. We all do it. We all think we're the victim sometimes. Even if it's just in our own heads, we think we're a victim of life. And it's just like, it's just, just stop. Just stop doing it. We all need to stop doing it. I need to stop doing it. You probably need to stop doing it. So some really great like tough love type moments in here. Some really great, just solid advice about showing up and doing your work because that is a huge part of being a creative person is you're not always going, there isn't always going to be the results that you want, but you still have to show up and do your work, whatever it is, like whatever you have chosen as your work and, and what is your passion and what you want to give your life to, you have to show up. Now, the side of me that is a little more critical this time around is is he's very black and white about some things. He kind of sets up this idea that there's like one way to do this, and I don't necessarily think that's true. He also knocks the concept of healing, which I think comes from a good place, but I do believe that sometimes people do need to take time to heal. I'm, I'm a big believer in like self-love and stuff like that, and I think that's necessary for living a creative life. So we kind of disagree there, Stephen. Yeah, he's a little bit more just like nose to the grindstone all the time, which is valuable sometimes, but personally, I don't think every minute of every day. <gasps> that being said, still a great book. Oh, there's this great anecdote in here too that I love where he's talking about showing up for your work every day and getting lost in your work and how sometimes you should just be so lost in your work that you're not focused on anything else, which I mean, I think you could consider like a flow state. If you're unfamiliar with flow states, you should look that up. He talks about just, just being so absorbed in your work and he tells a story about how he totally missed the Watergate scandal. Like he was just working so hard on his first like real book that didn't even see a lot of success, but he was working so hard on it that he entirely missed Watergate. And I love that because I think we could all probably benefit from missing like a few scandals nowadays. So yeah. Definitely check it out. would love to hear other people's thoughts. This is a really widely read book. So if you have thoughts on The War of Art, please comment down below. Let's keep the conversation rolling. War of Art, Stephen Pressfield. All right, book number three, Big Magic. I am so excited to talk about this book. Big Magic, Creative Living Beyond Fear. It's by Elizabeth Gilbert. I love her so much. If you are unfamiliar, there's so much by her out there. An amazing TED talk you should check out. Actually, I'll link it down below for you. And she is the author of Eat, Pray, Love, which I adore, which I also understand is like super basic of me, but I don't care. She also has a podcast that is based on all of this and ideas in this book. So lots to check out from her. This is essentially just, in a way, I kind of get a feeling that it's like the War of Art 
like 2.0 like there are some very similar ideas that she's dealing with and I I'm guessing she's read The War of Art it's a really well-known book it's especially on the topic of creativity and this book is all about that so I guarantee she's probably read it and there are lots of crossover like a lot of crossover ideas that happen however this one I vibe with it a lot more I mean it's it's a lot more There's room for a lot more magic, get it? Big magic. Both her own personal journey with creativity, the different things that she's battled with it, and the importance of just making or, or living, living your best life, really. This book is about living your best life. She really explores creativity and how it relates to just the joy of being a human and being alive and why it's important. It's like fundamentally important to who we are. I mean, I've read it twice already in the past couple months. I think it's just such an inspirational book. Oh, I love this moment so much. Okay, so she's talking about how being alive makes you a creative person because it's, I think, really common for people to just be like, oh, I'm not creative. And the thing is like, Creativity isn't everything. Like, you can be creative just because you're not a world famous visual artist doesn't mean you're not a creative person. Everything is infused with creativity. It's what humans do is we create. The guardians of high culture will try to convince you that the arts belong only to a chosen few, but they are wrong and they are also annoying. <laughs> That's like something I very much live by. As, as we've talked about so many times on our podcast is that there's this idea that fine art, visual art is, is only for, for high cultured society folks. And it's just simply not true. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, big thing she does in this book that I love and I think is different from what's going on in the War of Art. In the War of Art, I think what kind of rubbed me the wrong way the second time around is that he kind of has a little bit of a martyr mentality with his art and in Big Magic Elizabeth Gilbert really teases that out this idea that there has been this like this cultural idea that we've created that the artist must be like a martyr the tortured artist archetype basically that you know you have to give happiness and health away to be a good artist and Elizabeth Gilbert is basically like, that's bullshit. That's totally unnecessary, which I, I appreciate because sure, there are people out there who gave maybe their happiness and their health to their art and no shame to how they chose to live their life, of course. But the idea that you have to in order to make something of value is ridiculous. She talks a lot about genius and, and ideas like that, which once again, Stephen Pressfield also talks about muses. He talks about spiritual creative forces. Elizabeth Gilbert also talks about kind of spiritual creative forces. She discusses the concept of the genius and, and to her the trickster mentality kind of allows the creativity to flow and, and for you to just have fun with what the universe gives you. And once again, me personally, that makes a lot more sense to me because I'm hard enough on myself as it is. So having that kind of a mentality really helps me to create. Like I know personally that if I take creativity too seriously, um, I shut down completely. And I spent a lot of my 20s just kind of in a slump, not actually making much of anything because I felt very heavy about the concept of creativity and making. And because I am naturally very hard on myself, all the time it it just totally paralyzed me and I, I wasn't able to do anything and that's no good so I guess if that's your situation because I can't I can't you know maybe you're really great at approaching your creativity from more of like a martyr standpoint and if so like way to go but if maybe you're a little stifled or a little paralyzed creatively because because of that mentality, this book is 100% for you. It's all about, I mean, it's right there in the title, Creative Living Beyond Fear. It's all about getting past the fear and creating anyways and feeling good about it. She also has great advice about um, haters, basically, and like, like, people are always gonna hate what you do and it has nothing to do with you and it doesn't matter anyways basically talking about once you create something and put it out, put it out into the world, it's not yours anymore. It is now 
everyone else's and they are going to project onto it their own life and their own experiences. So, um, so much good stuff in this book. <laughs> please go read it. I'm going to stop talking about it or else I'm just going to tell you everything that's in it. So please go read this book. Three books. That was the first installment of the three book series. I hope you enjoyed it. I had fun with that. I hope you had fun with that. The next three books video is going to be three books on Frida, Frida Kahlo. Um, so that'll be a fun one. It might be me. It might be me and some of the other babes. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you're enjoying the new Art History Babes YouTube content. We've got some vlogs up. We got a new featured artist. We've got some art adventure type stuff going on. So definitely check all of that out. If there's something you want to see from us on YouTube, hit the comments. Let us know. If you haven't, check out the podcast. It's all linked below. Also, our Patreon will be below if you want to help us keep the podcast going, keep the YouTube going. We also have merch, all kinds of cool merch. Some of it's seasonal and won't be around much longer, so I'll link that down below for you as well. Um, thank you so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. You know, the drill. Bye!